start our panel conversation by um, picking up on sort of the challenge that Josh just laid out for us in terms of moving past episodic or ad hoc attempts at evidence-based policymaking and making this more of a matter of, of course. Um, so Jeff, why don't I start by pitching it to you and then, and then everyone please chime in. In, in your work with these various governments and agencies, I have a two-part question for you. So what are some strategies beyond the pay-for-success contracts that can be used um, to sort of support governments or incentivize governments to adopt this kind of evidence-based movement? And then second, how, how can you institutionalize this, to use Josh's word, and, and make, it, make these innovations last even when the individual champions in an agency move on or the political or policy context changes? So, so I think there are quite a few organizations that have gotten pretty good at helping governments do a single innovative project uh, well. And that could be, you know, Annie Casey in the child welfare space, uh, you know, certainly j Powell in the evaluation space, us in, 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 in a broader um, set of uh, performance spaces. I, I think all of us struggle with the question of how do you leave governments, first with the capacity to not have what you help them do collapse when you leave, second, to do another one of those projects without any uh, additional assistance, um, uh, and, um, you know, I, I think what one question is in giving the technical assistance, how much of your time do you spend just doing the work and how much do you spend on building capacity? And we try hard when we're doing projects uh, to think about how we uh, are training the employees of the, you know, who, are, who are already there at the agency to be doing the work and to be coaching them and not just doing the, the work for them. Sometimes that works. Sometimes, honestly, we just step in and do the work because there isn't anybody you can, who, who, can, who can do it. But I think having a coaching model rather than a do the work for them model uh, is, is really important. Um, and I think also one thing that happens in a lot of our um, engagements is um, a government agency comes to see the value of, of uh, having uh, capacity uh, on the evidence front and will make a hiring decision to hire someone like the kind of fellow we gave them on, on a permanent basis. And what we've seen in several agencies is you take an agency that doesn't have a culture of using data or evidence. Uh, it only takes a couple employees who, who do to sort of turn things around and make it a place where lots of other people like that want to come work as well. We, we actually wrote a policy brief on, on the city of Boston where they started with two people in this urban mechanics office. Uh, they now have a 25 person uh, analytic team and basically because there were these two cool people doing this work, lots of other people wanted to go there and it grew and, and if you want to read the history of that, there, you, can, you can go to our website. So, so I think there's a, there's a bit of, of just a couple champions and suddenly you can actually change the culture. That's great, thanks. So, so building on that, Christian, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you, because it seems like all the stars were aligned in South Carolina, that you all were able to build this team with a lot of different stakeholder groups, and it sounds like you, it's like a data mecca on top of that, right? So was it really just a matter of everything being aligned, or how did you actually get that process where you got so much buy-in from different groups? I mean, so, so I think... So one, yes, right. I mean, we, we got lucky. Yeah, you know, that 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 there, there there was that alignment. You know, that you had an intervention that was already in place and scalable. You know, where you had foundations that wanted to continue to support, but also wanted to not be fully financially responsible indefinitely. But were willing to work with us. You know, about a pretty long-term transition kind of period. Um, you, you know, I mean. Having some, you know, I mean, having an individual who had been the state budget chief and then move over to run the health and human services agency, you know, who still had sort of a personal relationship with the governor that could make sure that whatever needed to happen happened, you know, it's kind of an unusual confluence of factors. But that said, I mean, I think there are plenty of other ways to still make projects work without all those things present. You know, it just means a different way of trying to get at that kind of, you know, problem solving approach. You know, I think. Um, you know, kind of related to that, I'm sort of, I'm drawn back to one of the points that Josh made too, that, you know, as soon as this project got executed, I called Jeff and said, okay, well, that was fun for three years. Let's go find a bunch of projects we can do in six or nine or 12 months, right? You know, and, and I think, you know, as I think about sort of the evidence-based policy universe, you know, there's a couple different axes on which I would sort of, you know, kind of, you know, plot the different either projects or conceivable projects, right? So, you know, in our case, you know, the NFP one is a, you know, proven model, multiple RCTs, and we're just scaling it and, and providing it to more people. You know, and as we've talked about, you know, what, what would successive, pro what would new projects look like, things you could do faster, things that, you know, maybe fall somewhere else in the spectrum. You know, you can do 
you know, what I want to have is sort of a portfolio of projects, and I think we've started to get there, and actually, I guess you'll hear this in my teaser for tomorrow, right? So tomorrow you're going to hear from a couple other folks in the agency talking about other projects we're working on now, you know, including in some cases finding places where we already ha have data that has been randomized and figuring out what projects we can build and what evaluations we can build based on that without even having to go and do some new thing, you know? And so there's, there's a whole range of projects that I think you can, you can do. Um, you know, you've got to find people, you know, that institutionalization piece, I think one involves just getting more people inside the agency who, who have this as part of their job. You know, and I know that I've been torn on sort of that special unit question, right? Because like, you know, on the one hand, you're like, I want to make a special group, and this is the only thing they do. And then you think, okay, but what if the special, is that helping to institutionalize it, or is it creating the risk that all the eggs are in a single basket if somebody comes later, right? So you think, okay, well, I need, I need a special group, but then I also need other people inside the agency to make sure this kind of stuff continues. You know? And so you, you, you sort of play games in your head about what the right way is to make sure that everything stays in place. You know, again, the contractual framework can be used to lock things in for several years, but, but only for individual projects, not necessarily to make these things um, you know, stay, to make that sort of cultural change stay, stay durable over time. You know, and then again, you know, I think we also want to get to places where we've got you know, less proven models that we're trying to maybe scale and build upon, and then also just things that are you know, greenfield, brand new things that we haven't tested at all yet, and let's go do the first shot with it, but, but make sure, you know, that we evaluate it rigorously as we go, you know, and, and I think if we can get to a place where we've got a series of projects that fall in different places on that spectrum, and then fall in different places on the six, nine, 12, 18 months to execution stage, you know, that you can, I mean, it almost becomes like CD laddering, right, where like at any given time, you've got a couple projects that are moving to execution, you've got some that are in a very developmental stage, and you've got others that you're basically, you know, done or close to done doing service delivery on and you've moved in the evaluation period. You want to get a jump in? Yeah, I think it's, it's a great question to think about how you get in an evaluation mindset and an experimentation mindset. And, and we've been, I think, uh, justifiably self-congratulatory about the massive infrastructure and buy-in that was necessary to launch a big scale project like this nurse family partnership evaluation. And I want to highlight that complementary approaches to that can be very low cost and really much more easily executed if one is always looking for the opportunities. And I think that, that goes along with what you were saying. Say you're trying something new in your state or your county and you have to pilot it somewhere first because you don't know if it's going to work or not. You're going to pilot it in a few communities. It's just as easy to say, instead of taking the first five communities that raise their hands, I'm going to take the first 10 communities that raise their hand and randomly choose five of those. It's no more expensive. You're not rolling it out in any more places than you were before. You're not having to collect any more data than you were before necessarily. But suddenly, you can learn a ton from that experience, whereas before, maybe you couldn't. There are lots of opportunities for sort of found experiments. In the introduction, you mentioned Oregon, the Oregon study, and that was a great opportunity to evaluate the effects of Medicaid. It was a massive data collection effort, but it didn't happen because somebody was as visionary as to say, we're going to do a randomized controlled trial. It happened because they said, we only have 10,000 spots in our Medicaid program. How are we going to allocate them? Drawing straws seems like the fairest thing to do. So one really wants to be purposeful in designing RCTs whenever possible. But I hope you're sensing the ominous undertones of all of this. <laughs> one also wants to be really opportunistic. And those opportunities, if you're always thinking, how could we do this in a way that's more easily evaluated? How could we be a little strategic about deploying those resources? There are a lot of experiments out there waiting to happen, and that's part of the reason I mentioned the administrative data, too. You couple the, the mindful strategic rollout with databases that already exist, and you can have an evaluation that is really not such a heavy lift. So I just, before I open it up, I want to pose uh, a question to Josh about Kate's now mentioned, I think, pilot programs twice. I know this is something the Arnold Foundation has, has um, sort of championed. Can you just speak for a couple of minutes to those folks who, who perhaps haven't done this yet? Um, and sort of what's the, the role and importance of pilot programs? Well, I, I think that there are uh, two reasons that you might want to pilot. So uh, the first reason is uh, very much the South Carolina situation. So too often, um, in, whenever we do implement new programs and we implement it with an evaluation, uh, we plan a timeline that says, okay, we're going to start the 
uh, program and the evaluation at exactly the same time, but we're asking people to do something that they've never done before, and maybe you did three days of training and you kind of did some practice runs in that training in a hotel room like this. Um, but you know, getting out in the field and actually doing something and figuring out how all the stuff that you plan, the binders of standard operating procedures, actually are implemented out in the field is it, you all of a sudden have to throw it up in the air and start all over again. Um, and so a reason to do it is to work out those implementation kinks so that whenever you actually start the evaluation, you're not scrambling to fix implementation problems at the same time. Um, a second reason to pilot is, um, so I mentioned uh, earlier that um, there's any individual project has a low probability of success, right? And so to increase the probability of success, you want to build a little bit of evidence to know that you're kind of on the right track. So another reason to pilot is to build a little bit of that evidence uh, before you start trying to scale. Uh, so do a pilot study so that you kind of understand what the potential of the idea is or um, at least have some data to base the next bet on and then you can scale from there. Great, thank you. Okay, we will have somebody with a microphone and so I'm just going um, to ask that, that when you're handed the microphone, please just introduce yourself and say where you're from and then speak clearly. Any questions? Everyone's ready to go run a huge nurse family partnership. Um, it's just that easy. <laughs> That's right. Shy or everyone wants to go to the dance party? Okay, yeah. Um, in, in the North or South Carolina, sorry, Henry Fitz, city of Rochester, New York. Uh, in the South Carolina example, were you involved at all on making the push to get to the place where there was integrated data to support this kind of I mean, I know that may not have been the original intention of, of creating such a data warehouse, but were you involved with that project? Do you want to talk about our Yeah, I mean, a lot of ways it was, general, it was already present. Um, and, and it was another one of those things where we just kind of got lucky on. I mean, we, we did, um, I mean, really a lot of the work we had to do on, on that was on data sharing agreements, right? It was a lot of making lawyers still stop working. being in the way. Right, that's right. We're still not 100% okay. in the way there. And, no, and, and I mean, you know, Kate talked you know, about the, the length of this study, right? That it is unusual in the sense that we're gonna follow, I'm done, I, 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 don't, I don't do anything anymore. You're gonna follow. <laughs> 2022. Um, yeah, <laughs> I signed the contract and I'm out. Uh, the, um, you know, that, you know, when you follow kids that long, you run into sort of weird, even more unusual kinds of data sharing issues, right? So like, you know, if we're looking for social security numbers for kids who have not been born yet, right? Because the Nurse Family Partnership treats moms and the first born kid and that's their whole thing. Well, like, there's gonna be things, in order to understand the full impact of this intervention on, on mom and the rest of that family in the long run, you wanna know what happens to the other kids not yet known or knowable to us, right? So when it's time to go find social security numbers for successive children, how do you write a data sharing agreement that lets you get SSNs you know, years later for people not yet born. You know, yeah. and, and if you figure that out, let, let me know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, well, there's actually a self, uh, there's a little uh, stamped envelope <laughs> in all your folders. You know, you, you don't even have to pay for the stamp. But um, yeah, but those, those are unusual kinds of data sharing agreements, you know, issues you don't really run into. And so like there's, there, there's a technical infrastructure, right, for data sharing, you know, which systems talk to each other, what fields are available, what level of confidence do you have in whatever data are stored in those IT systems. And then there's sort of like a legal and relationship, you know, framework that you know overlaps with with uh, data sharing as well. And so, like the the technical you know, capacity was largely present already in South Carolina. There was a lot of work to do on the um, on the paperwork and the lawyering front. And, and that's one of the things that JPAL is very helpful with in terms of having uh, templates available. And of course. The template never works exactly for your situation. Where's the template for the imaginary children? Um, but, but the infrastructure, you don't have to start from ground zero. And a lot of other states seem to be moving towards these models of integrated data, in part because you can now, modern computing is making it possible, but also because I think it's really helpful for states and localities to know these people that we're serving in this program, are they the same as the people we're serving in the other program? And if we're spending more money in this program, how is that related to the money that's being spent in this other silo? And being able to march the people across the silos is the first step to being able to march the dollars across the silos as well. So I think it's really useful from a, a state's understanding of its own budget mechanics, and that's the genesis of these in several states that I've heard of. It's also a great hook for the evaluator uh, team to be able to say, we're 
thrilled to get our hands on this data, and here's the kind of information we can give you that you've built the capacity to generate, but you just don't have the manpower to produce these kinds of statistics. You're not spending your time pouring over the data the way our team is. And so it's, uh, we like to think that we're providing value added to South Carolina and to the Nurse Family Partnership Office by saying, hey, here's something from your own data that we've learned that might be useful to you in fielding your program. Here's, how you, here, here's what your costs really look like, or, or here's what this long right tail is doing to the distribution of resources in case you want to use that information. Yeah, and I, actually, yeah, in, in defense of duct tape too, right? So like, you know, <laughs> I, I, when we think about data sharing, we often think about like old school integration, right? Like where you go and find like the one COBOL and the one Fortran guy you've got and say, I need you to make these systems talk to each other. And then they spend 11 years, you know, like trying to figure out how to make it, like, I, I mean, especially in these shorter projects we're looking at now, I mean, like, it's a lot of, you know, like, especially now that Excel can go beyond 56,000 rows, like, <laughs> like, it's a lot of VLOOKUP, right? I mean, like, you just take a lot of stuff and you dump it into Excel, and then you dump this other stuff into Excel, and then people stay up all night and do VLOOKUP, and you're like, that's, yeah, that's it. You know, like, you know, like there's, a, there's a real, like, fly-by-night way to do a lot of the stuff that you need to do in order to figure out which projects make sense and which ones don't. Would you tell your lawyers that? <laughs> oh, uh, I'll tell the lawyers who, who I pay that. <laughs> the, the, the lawyers in the Central General Counsel Office, we have a different story okay. for. Maya. Hi. Uh, Maya with Results for America. I'm curious to know in the South Carolina example, what was the very first step in getting this project to come to be an idea? You know, was it you thinking that you wanted to scale up NFP or was there a foundation or, or what was it? And then, and Jeff, I wonder if you can kind of go after and, and also talk about just the examples in other jurisdictions. Is there anything in common about what's starting these projects, what's initiating them? Um, so I guess, you know, first steps, the, um, I think in a lot of ways the, the first step is Jeff putting out the call for you know, applicants and proposals for, for state and local governments to pitch. And I think originally there were going to be four slots for the Social Impact Bond Lab. Um, and the, the application was, it was, it was just a few pages, but you basically had to lay out what, what you thought you were going to do um, and, and, and give a pretty high level pitch of what the project was going to be. So like, we had to have some sense of what it was you were asking for. Um, you know, through the sort of the, the miracle of timing, you know, that, that landed on my desk at about the same time that McKinsey's study of social impact bonds landed on my desk. Um, which landed on my desk around the same time as um, sort of a rough feasibility study for, for the NFP work that was already happening through the foundations, right? So basically the, my insight was to take the three things that sat on my desk and think, that's one thing, right? And, like, and that was it, right? So like, then I just filled out the little application and sent it off to Jeff. Um, so, I mean, it was just kind of those things. But those things all hit within weeks of each other. So I, I think I have an answer to this question and a model for what, what matters here, and it, it, but, but to explain it to you, it's going to make me look sort of stupid, so I'll have to explain the following thing. So when the Rockefeller <laughs> Foundation got us going uh, on this, they funded us to help a couple states, and then they said, that's going well, here's money to fund four more states, and you have to run a national competition to select them. And I said, no way, I'm not running a national competition. I said, first of all, there hasn't been one of these pay for success contracts in the United States. No one is going to imply, apply, and it's going to be really embarrassing to me as a Harvard professor when no one applies for my free services. And I don't <laughs> want that to happen. And then I said, you know, something even worse could happen. We have four slots, and six governments might apply, and I'm going to have to tell two governors who are asking for help running their social programs better that they are the losers of my competition. I refuse to run a competition. And Rockefeller said, well, if you want the money, you're running a competition. And I said, I'm not running a competition, and I wanted the money, so I caved. And they were so <laughs> smart, uh, and I was so stupid, honestly. Um, what, what turned out to happen here is there were lots of people in government who were sort of intrigued by doing stuff, but they were busy, and they mostly needed their boss's approval to go forward. And if they took this to their boss, what's some innovative project, their boss would say, come back to me in six months. But now they had an action-forcing event. Do we apply for Harvard's assistance? And that was like a thing where their boss had to make a decision. And so it allowed a lot of people to go to their bosses and say, hey, we're sort of interested in this thing. We've, I've read about this here or there. Make a decision, yes or no. And in, in this case, 28 governments made the yes decision and applied for our, our, our assistance. And 11 of them were, were good projects. And as you've heard, Rockefeller funded four. But luckily, I had my good friend Josh over here who took care of the rest. And we were able to do, we were able to do, 10, we were able to do 10 of the 11 uh, good projects. The, the truth is, there was a really good pro project from, uh, proposal from Oregon, but I decided I didn't want to fly that far. And so we only did 10 of the 11. So. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm not sure this should all be on this videotape. Is a good process. We're going to edit this. We're going to edit this later. Uh, so John Gurian from Northwestern University. So this is a quick question for Christian. So how, um, how explicit and how, what type of thinking uh, has happened at the, the government level about what, uh, what will happen depending on whether the results are positive or negative? Like, is that just something that, you know, once we see the results, then we'll talk about it and we'll decide? Or are there people who sort of are, you know, are aware of what's going on in uh, 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 participating in the development of the research who are sort of thinking, well, if it finds, if we find this, then we'll do this. If it's, we find that, then we'll do that. Yeah. So what's next? I mean, so, um, you know, one, um, the, the evaluation results will come in after the end of the current administration. Um, so, you know, on the government side, I, I, I have no idea, you know, in terms of even who the decision makers will be. I, I think in terms of, you know, at a very high level, what are the possible outcomes? I think, you know, one option is that things look great and the decision is we should apply for a new waiver to basically continue the program under slightly modified but comparable kinds of conditions, right? So I think if, if the results look pretty good, that's one likely outcome. You know, another possibility would be that, you know, States ask for waivers basically in order to be able to, to limit access to services in some way, to either be able to say only so many people can receive these services or we're not going to spend more than X dollars, you know, that the waiver is there to kind of control risk. Um, if you put services into the, um, the, the Medicaid state plan, they become basically open to all comers. And so I know what NFP wants is to have you know, this, you know, shining beacon of a report that says everything is great, and then you should just, you know, NFP always saves money, it's right for everybody, and you should just put it in the state plan, and it'll be open to anybody forever in South Carolina. You know, I think that's what sort of their hope for outcome, and, and the whole thing could just crash and burn. We might look at it and say this was a disaster, and then the waiver, at the end of the waiver period, it just sunsets, and that's the end of the project. I mean, so I think you've basically got those three things as being sort of likely or possible conceivable outcomes for the project. You know, in terms of sort of, you know, again, the deciders, I mean, so you'll have a new administration, you'll have some other director for the agency. Um, but, but because, I mean, as much of a headache as it was to put together this massive coalition of the willing, right, I mean, to get this whole project built and executed, it means that there's lots of other people who are still going to be at the table um, when it's decision time. You know, so the, I think it's reasonably likely that, you know, that many of the foundations are going to have the same, you know, you know, people in key positions. You know, so there should be a lot of continuity at the at the project governance level, where even, you know, though, you know, we could be five Medicaid directors away if we're five years from now, you know, that, um, you know, there's enough other folks along the way who are going to remember and know what was discussed and think about what the right next steps are for the project. Time for one last question. Okay. Uh, Greg Russ, Cambridge Housing, uh, again. Uh, I'm interested in following the money a little bit in the sense of there's a lot of work to pull this together. There's the initial period, there was the pilot period. How does the, uh, how does the relationship between what is funded at that stage and by whom, how does that connect then to the, the pay for success, which is obviously based on uh, results uh, from the metrics that were identified? How do they, how do they connect to make a path? Is that me? That's another money question. Yeah. You're at OMB. You should be doing this one. The, uh, um, He's got the money. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. The, I, I think there's a couple different ways, I guess, to sort of follow the money, right? So the, you've, you've got one version of follow the money in terms of how do you design the project and even get to the execution stage, right? So you've got you know, Rockefeller Institute money. You've got Laura and John Arnold Foundation money that help you know, sort of support the entire technical assistance effort. Um, you know, as part, once we got selected, you know, uh, you know, Jeff placed a sort of resident project manager with us inside the agency who was with us for, you know, basically a year and a half or so, and then still was available to us because then Josh hired her. Um, and so I'd keep Thank calling you, her. I'd, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I'd keep calling her and say, go out in the hallway for a minute. We got to talk about this for a while. You know, and, and so, um, you know, so there was a lot of foundation money involved in supporting getting it off the ground. We did a pilot for a few months for exactly the reasons you heard a few minutes ago, you know, and that was also supported by the Arnold Foundation. So that's, that's one version of follow the money. In terms of how the project works, you know, and I guess this nuance changed over time, right? So I, I think it, you probably can't really describe our project as a social impact bond in the sense that there's not investor capital involved in it. Yeah, and ultimately, we can only make the project financially work once we threw the money changers out of the temple. You know, and, and 
you know, and, and frankly, that's fine, right? Because it means there's one less set of parties at the table making a super complicated contract even more complicated. Um, part of the waiver is that, you know, you have state and federal money come together through the Medicaid program to make the per visit payments. Um, and so those per visit payments, um, you know, reimburse NFP for a relatively small fraction of their actual delivery costs. Um, the philanthropic money, the $17 million in foundation money, sort of comes in to help sit on top of, the, of that payment so that NFP can essentially get its costs covered as it goes. Um, but the success payments on the back end are there because in a lot of ways, you know, NFP agreed to reduce its delivery costs by 25% over the, on a sort of a, you know, per mom-child dyad basis over the course of this project. So that's one of the big question marks is what happens to the NFP model if you take 25% of a haircut. Um, you know, so, so part of the goal of that $17 million in foundation money is that, you know, if you sit and, and sort of imagine the graph of time and then money, the, the philanthropic money is that triangle that helps NFP sort of get to a place where hopefully if all this works out, um, they're essentially able to recover their costs, you know, without having a huge, you know, philanthropic commitment on top of it. So, you know, the way that stuff gets, I think you asked about how that money gets sort of locked in and targeted and, 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 and controlled. That three-way contract between the state and Nurse Family Partnership and the Children's Trust, we, that was the sort of, uh, you know, legal insight that finally made this thing all come together from a paperwork standpoint. Because there's a lot of, one of the risks we haven't talked about yet is, is the risk of non-appropriation, right? That what happens if at some point in the future the General Assembly doesn't put money into the contract? So the way we made this all work was I pre-funded the entire success payment account and through that three-way contract gave all of the money to the Children's Trust to throw it off the state's books so the General Assembly couldn't try to claw it back if there's a recession in the future. And then after the evaluation is done and they get the results, they'll make the payments from the Children's Trust out of that escrow account and then any money that's left over will come back to the state at that point. So that was the, the gimmick that, that, that made everything finally work, and that's what sort of controls the money flowing around. And then just to add one point onto that, it highlights, you know, most of the time when I do research, like the best case scenario is that somebody reads it. <laughs> and here we're doing something where millions of dollars hang on this one point estimate of what the effect of the program was. So it's really important that, of course, everybody has to agree on the financial framework, but everybody has to agree ahead of time on exactly how those numbers are going to be calculated. Because goodness knows we don't want to be responsible afterwards for choosing among estimates that millions of dollars hang on. We all want to say up front, here's the right way to answer this question, play around with control group data, baseline data, all agree on the basic analytical plan and then have the payments based on that. So, so everybody has to be on board with how the money is flowing and how it's being determined whether those success benchmarks were achieved or not. Okay. Please join me in thanking our panelists.